Good afternoon and welcome to the Environmental Law Institute. You've joined us for Law and Policy of Product Regulations. My name is Hannah Keating and I am Manager of Education Programs here at ELI. We're delighted to welcome everyone to the seventh seminar of ELI's annual summer school series. And I encourage you to join us here at ELI next Tuesday for our final summer school session. For more information, please see the events page on our website, eli.org, and thank you all for coming. At the end of today's panel, we'll have time for a question and answer session, and we encourage you to ask your questions at that time. If you're joining us in the room, we have a microphone to bring around at that time. And if you're joining us through GoToWebinar, please submit your questions through GoTo's question box, and please do not wait until the end. Send your questions as soon as you think of them. I would also like to thank our outstanding panelists for joining us today to lend her leadership to summer school. While I'll introduce Lynn briefly momentarily, her full bio is posted on our website, www.eli.org, and I encourage you to check out her expertise and experience there in more detail. As we begin, I will now like to introduce our panelist, Lynn Bergeson. Lynn is the owner and owner of and managing partner at Bergeson & Campbell PC, where she counsels corporations, trade associations, and businesses on a wide range of issues pertaining to chemical hazard exposure and risk assessment, risk communication, minimizing legal li liability, and evolving regulatory and policy matters pertinent to conventional bio-based and nanoscale chemicals. Her focuses um, include Tosca, FIFRA, REACH, OSHA, and more. And with that, I'd like to warmly turn things over to you, Lynn, to get us started. Thank you so much, Hannah, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here, and thank mm -hmm. you for being online. Uh, we're going to talk today about TSCA and FIFRA. Those are the two primary federal uh, statutes that apply to chemical substances. Let's skip over that. All right. Um, as Hannah said, I practice in this area and have for a long time. Um, I didn't start out doing Tosca law, but um, evolved into that. Um, and Washington is a very good place to do that uh, kind of law because neither the Toxic Substances Control Act nor the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, AKA FIFRA, are delegated to the states, unlike some of the other federal statutes with which you may have reviewed this past summer during the uh, summer series, like Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Resource Conservation Recovery Act. FIFRA is really uh, very Washington-centric, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, for present purposes, we are going to be spending the next hour and a half, um, not necessarily divided equally between these two federal statutes, TSCA, uh, which regulates industrial chemicals, and FIFRA, which regulates pesticides uh, or agricultural chemicals, as we call them, which includes biocides, antimicrobials, um, and chemicals of that sort. What is really important to understand right here and right now is much of a lot of what you need to understand is that whether a chemical substance falls in the Tosca industrial bucket or the FIFRA pesticide bucket depends on intent. I brought a prop. <laughs> My colleague Cheryl found this because I often refer to chemicals as pixie dust because you don't want to reveal anything that's proprietary. So the default name is, you know, so-and-so's magic pixie dust. So this is pixie dust, all-purpose magic mojo. <laughs> and it contains a, a powdery substance inside. Now, this powdery substance can easily be regulated under the Toxic Substances Control Act as an industrial chemical if the manufacturer intends it to perform certain industrial um, capacities and functionalities. Or it could easily be same substance regulated under FIFRA as an industrial agrochemical if certain pesticidal claims are made or implied with regard to the, this stuff. And you can also have chemicals that are so-called dual use. In other words, depending upon the specific use and application of that chemical will dictate whether it's regulated under TSCA or regulated under FIFRA. So that's just remember the pixie dust that it's not so much driven by the actual chemical species or identity of the substance, but rather the intent and application of that material, okay? We're also not going to be focusing on 
other statutes that are also very important. For example, the Federal Hazardous Substances Act is an important product specific chemical or um, uh, consumer product regulation derivative of the Consumer uh, Product Safety Commission. We're also not going to be talking about Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act regulations or Federal Trade Commission, which uh, the Federal Trade Commission has so-called green guides um, that dictate what you can and cannot represent about the greenness, recyclability, reclamation, energy content value um, of, a, of, a, of a product. Uh, also states increasingly have a whole range of statutes at the state level that might specifically relate to either a chemical or a product category, like chemical chemicals that might have a unique um, exposure to sensitive subpopulations, might be uniquely notorious for some reason or another, chrome, lead, some of the other metals, uh, or, or product categories like products marketed to infants and children. So, for example, the California Safer Consumer Product Regulations, a very important chemical law relating to product categories in California. Uh, the California Cleaning Product Right to Know Act is another California-specific law that might have value down the road as states kind of mimic it, but it, it is not regulated under federal law. Um, there's a similar uh, law under New York called the New York Household Cleansing Product uh, Information Disclosure Act, which is very similar but different from the California state law, again, regulating information disclosure pertinent to that classification of chemicals as cleaning or cleansing products. And of course, every state has a state consumer protection law, which also might dictate how a chemical or chemical product category is to be regulated. Those are all creatures of state law, not federal law. My point here in enumerating these authorities is to make sure that you appreciate that TSCA and FIFRA are the foundational federal authorities, but don't exhaust the field, okay? And I neglected to mention that if anybody has a question here in the audience, we're going to defer to you and, and take that question. I don't see what questions might be online, but we'll have an opportunity to address questions um, at the end of the program. So let's talk first about the Toxic Substances Control Act. TSCA, as we refer to it, was originally passed in 1976, over 40 some years ago, 43 years ago to be exact. Um, it is the foundational federal law that regulates industrial chemicals, super important law. And it really touches just about every manufacturing sector in the United States. So it's important, and for reasons we'll talk about, it's even more important today because it was re, there was a redo, a TSCA remake back in uh, 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 2016, which we'll talk about. But it's even more influential, more important um, to manufacturers in the industrial chemical community. And if you are a practitioner or a consultant, it's even more relevant now because it, it, it's more uh, expansive in its application, record keeping requirements and other legal obligations. Uh, but the 2016 TSCA do-over is otherwise known as the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. It was signed by Mr. Obama, President Obama on June 22nd, 2016. And ELI and GW University and uh, Bergeson and Campbell just celebrated the third uh, anniversary of TSCO and um, in your chairs, there was uh, information on how to access some of the um, substantive discussions at that really interesting all day uh, event. Okay, so what is TSCO intended to do? Well, it is really thought to be kind of a catch all statute. There are other uh, statutes and other important requirements that might apply to products and manufacturing operations, but TSCA really is intended to provide this general safety net. Um, as I noted, it's just one of several regulatory authorities that might apply at the federal level and the state level, but this law applies very uniquely to industrial chemicals. And as noted, it has changed remarkably over the past three years. And if this is an area that you're thinking about getting into as a practitioner, 
or thinking about diving into more substantively as a scientist uh, because of the risk assessment, toxicological science implications of task. It's a fascinating, fabulous area to get into because it, it really is the epicenter of law, science, and policy. What is the purpose behind TSCA? Well, if you can think back to 1976 when the law was first signed um, into um, action, there was no law that regulated chemical substances, the NEAT, meaning pure chemical substance that is either imported into the United States or manufactured here. And there are all kinds of instances where chemical exposures were causing harm or risk both to people and inviting elements of environmental degradation. So Congress in its infinite wisdom really identified three key foundational purposes behind the Toxic Substances Control Act. The first is to provide information on the human health and environmental effects of chemical substances industrial chemical substances. Second, to regulate these chemical substances and mixtures, which is simply the one or two or three or four chemical substances mixed together, that's considered a chemical mixture, that um, are deemed to possibly present unreasonable risk of injury to human health and the environment under intended conditions of use and to take action with respect to imminent hazards, okay? And all of these terms embedded in that to regulate chemicals bullet point is a defined term of art that we'll talk a little bit about. But unreasonable risk is the standard. And that's an important legal concept to remember because it's like no, it's not no risk. It's no unreasonable risk. And that's where kind of the rubber hits the road in terms of deciding whether or not something needs to be regulated. Is it reasonable or an unreasonable risk? Because certain amounts of risk are accommodated in our in our legal system and in the regulatory uh, infrastructure of, of TSCA. And also, very importantly, under uh, the law, under TSCA Section 2B3, this is a provision that we are frequently urged to remind EPA of, and EPA is very sensitive, this is there should be no regulation of a chemical substance that unduly impedes or creates unnecessary economic barriers to technological innovation. Because not surprisingly, Chemical technologies, particularly ones that are newer, faster, greener, and purportedly more sustainable, um, have to be pre-approved by EPA. And again, TSCA is a no unreasonable risk statute, it's a risk benefit statute. So our job as counsel to many chemical innovators is to make sure that we're putting our best foot forward in a demonstrating that this chemical substance doesn't pose an unreasonable risk and not allowing it into commerce as a new chemical substance might pose an unreasonable barrier to innovation. And that delicate balance there often poses interesting and vexing both legal and policy issues that the agency has been dealing with, particularly since TSCA was reauthorized in 2016. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is go through um, in a logical sequence some of the key provisions of TSCA. There are lots of sections. Um, the What I use just for, for your benefit is if you go to the Environmental Defense Fund website, there is a very, very useful um, red line strikeout version of TSCA. Old, you know, it takes the old TSCA and then embeds in it red line strikeouts of the new provisions of TSCA. Um, I have found this over the past three years to be pretty invaluable because it identifies what's new and what's not. But uh, there's a lot of changes that were occasioned by the new law. And I'm going to try to stick to a 5,000 foot above level. If anybody has any questions after this um, presentation, I am more than happy to speak with you on the phone or visit or spend some time here because it's a very complicated law and there's lots of ins and outs. But Time will not permit us to go into everything in detail. Okay, we're going to talk about principally testing new chemicals, existing chemicals, record keeping and reporting, which is super important because that's the foundational basis upon which EPA is able to review and make informed decisions about what might pose an unreasonable risk, relationship with other federal laws, CBI, confidential information, and then um, Section 26, 
First off, what is a chemical substance? Well, it really is very broad, but it covers industrial chemicals, but excludes chemicals that are not regulated under other federal laws. We've already talked about FIFRA, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about, but that covers chemicals that might, might be the same chemical substance, but has a represented, claimed, or implied pesticidal attribute. That's covered by FIFRA. Food additives, drugs, cosmetics, uh, and food preparations are covered by the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act by FDA. Okay, so that's another big bucket, and I can further complicate your mind and your life, and I'm not going to do that, but you could have a trifecta of a chemical substance regulated under FFDCA, FDA, TSCA, EPA, and EPA FIFRA, depending again upon the application and the claims made about that chemical substance. That's what makes this so much fun. Um, also, we, we want to make sure that you appreciate that a manufacturer is defined under TSCA to include folks that make stuff overseas and import it into the United States. So the fact that it's imported in China or Korea or Europe, as soon as it hits the territorial waters of the United States and is considered admitted into the United States by customs, it's manufactured here. Okay, so it's a very broad reach. TSCA also um, is a very important distinction between new chemical substances, chemical substances that are new to TSCA, um, meaning that they are not found on the TSCA inventory, which is a list maintained under TSCA Section 8 of every chemical substance that has some uh, legal cognizance here in the United States. And there are about 86,000 chemicals listed on the TSCA inventory, but as we'll talk about, only about an exact number here, 40,655 are actually in commerce. And that's a consequence of one of the changes of the 2016 law, where Congress basically said, you know what? There aren't 86,000 chemicals in commerce. A lot of those chemicals are vestigial. They might have been introduced years ago, but they're no longer in commerce. We're going to like keep them on the inventory, but we're going to flag them as inactive. And so the process that the agency went through over the last couple of years was to distill a list of actual chemical substances in commerce. And there are about 40,000 of them, okay? So that was a very valuable exercise because often there was a lot of, um, a lack of clarity as to really how meaningful the inventory is in identifying as a baseline chemical substance in commerce in the United States. What are some of the super major changes um, occasioned by the new law? Well, I'm going to try to key off of what some of the major criticisms of old TSCA were, because TSCA, not surprisingly, is a very technical, important chemical statute. The run-up to modification in 2016 was at least 10 years. And that's not a reflection of indecision of our lawmakers on Capitol Hill, although that would be a fair statement today. Um, but it's also a reflection of the complexity and the zeal of the stakeholders who really fought hard for certain changes in the law. And there are some changes that reasonable people agreed upon. Number one, that first bullet there, the mandatory duty of EPA to evaluate existing chemicals. Old TSCA, um, for those of us that kind of love the law, really appreciated the exquisite logic and structure of TSCA, of old TSCA, when it was uh, promulgated back in 1976. The problem is it didn't give EPA any express mandate to do anything. And so with respect to existing chemicals, all 86,000 of them, there weren't that many back in 76, but TSCA, as a law, didn't authorize or compel by a date certain EPA to review any of those existing chemical substances. It, everything was kind of grandfathered onto this inventory. So a lot of people were laboring under the mistaken notion that, well, if it's on the TSCA inventory, EPA must have taken some sort of de novo review of its toxicological properties and environmental fake uh, characteristics. And truth be told, there was no review, okay? So they just got up on the inventory, and so the existing law didn't compel that by a date certain, according to certain metrics, the agency 
independently review that chemical substance and the uses and applications to which it was being put. New Tosca fixes that. Um, so there's a mandatory duty for EPA to look at every chemical substance that is active in the United States, all 40,655 of them, and determine if they're high priority or low priority. If they're high priority, they must be reviewed by EPA. And if the unreasonable risk is found in any of the conditions of use to which that chemical substance may be applied, the agency is required by law to identify risk mitigation measures and to regulate that potential risk or unreasonable risk until it's gone. So it's very logical, okay? But it's a big deal, and it's a, a lot of work imposed upon EPA. The new law also requires that the chemicals are assessed against a risk-based safety standard with no, consider of, no consideration of non-risk factors, and that means the ka-ching factor, no consideration of what it would cost to regulate that risk out of existence. That's another big change occasioned by the 2016 law, largely in response to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decision in 1981, corrosion proof fittings, where the court invalidated EPA's rulemaking limiting and regulating asbestos on grounds that the agency did not apply the correct legal standard, which compelled it to identify the least burdensome regulatory uh, fix to the problem. So the new law now states that EPA has to identify the risk and if there's an unreasonable risk found, EPA must regulate that unreasonable risk, and it cannot consider non-risk monetary factors in doing so. Also, unreasonable risk identified in the risk evaluation must be eliminated. So in other words, if an unreasonable risk is found in a risk evaluation by EPA, that unreasonable risk must be regulated until it is eliminated. I mean, you can't be more emphatic than that. And Congress really baked that into the actual law. So there's no hint of an absence of a mandate now in the new law. And finally, uh, EPA expanded EPA's, or Congress expanded EPA's authority to compel the development of chemical data. Under the old law, um, EPA could compel the, the uh, submission of new toxicological or information pertinent to a chemical substance, but it usually had to do so by a very lengthy rulemaking that months dragged into years and years dragged into infinity and beyond. So to eliminate the Buzz Lightyear effect, now EPA can issue unilateral testing orders to say, we want these data. EPA always has um, an uh, authority under 11C to compel by subpoena the submission of certain information, but now section four authorizes EPA to issue unilateral testing orders, which is kind of a big deal. EPA hasn't done that yet, but we're confident it will do so soon. Um, the new law requires EPA to make an affirmative, this is so important, with regard to new chemical substances, EPA now must make an affirmative determination with regard to that chemical substance as a condition precedent to commercialization. Under old TSCA, new chemicals entered into the market in the absence of an EPA action. So now chemical innovators and manufacturers and importers are required to demonstrate that the chemical substances they wish to manufacture and distribute in commerce commercially pose no unreasonable risk. Before, that affirmative determination was not required and it was really incumbent upon EPA to prove that an unreasonable risk existed, not that the chemical substance does not pose an unreasonable risk. So the burden has been kind of inverted in that EPA's implementation of these new Section 5 affirmative determinations has posed a lot of very interesting issues, but EPA is working through them and we're getting to a very good place now. Also with regard to the assertion of confidential business information, I can't tell you how important it is that your pixie dust, your magic formula, order the what is the chemical uh, identity of your magic stuff? You know, this is usually the process or the result of a multi-year lengthy research and development process to prove efficacy and functionality and so on and so forth. So the, the identity of that chemical substance is usually very carefully guarded. And there's a bunch of other categories of confidential business information. Who are your customers? How do you make the stuff? And other things that are clearly confidential business information, CBI. I think in years past under the old law, 
um, people were probably not as disciplined as they might be in terms of asserting protection from um, withholding information from being disclosed to the public, either to EPA to put up on the internet or through a Freedom of Information Act request. So now, if you're asserting CBI claims, and unless they are presumptively CBI, like chemical identity and how it's made, you have to corroborate at the front end why you believe that claim of CBI is warranted. And you also have a 10-year lock on it. And after 10 years, once EPA comes back and says, are you sure you want the CBI now? If you don't affirmatively re-up and demonstrate that it still applies, you'll lose it. So very important um, change. Also, in the olden days, under old TSCA, um, there are very few fees applied. Now, TSCA is very similar to FIFR in that it's kind of a pay to play. So the fees for certain EPA actions, and I have a schedule here. Uh, if you submit a pre-manufacture notification, the fee has gone up from $2,500 per PMN to $16,000. Um, unless you're a small business, in which case it's only 2,800. Um, if you have a an exemption application, it's gone up from nothing <laughs> to 4,700. Um, the the real kind of eye popping fees get into uh, risk evaluations. Um, an EPA initiated risk evaluation is now 1.3 million dollars, and the manufacturers or others participating in that risk evaluation uh, have to pay that money. And it's, you know, in my view, personal view, that's all it is, is it's money well spent. The agency needs resources and you cannot rely upon appropriations in all cases to support this. So the agency needs money to get the technical bandwidth and core competencies to undertake these very sophisticated, very important risk evaluations. So Small businesses get a break, but the fee schedule has gone way up. And that's all occasioned by the Lautenberg Act. Um, we're going to talk about Section 8 because from the risk or, or data generation and uh, record keeping and reporting obligations flow all the other logical uh, provisions under the Act. So Section 8 is super important. It's important because it is the provision that allows EPA under various provisions to mandatorily seek information from chemical manufacturers, distributors, uh, importers, and others. Um, and you, you kind of want EPA to have broad authority so it can, it can make really informed science-based decisions based on not presumptions, but rather actual data. So Section 8 authorizes EPA to require chemical manufacturers, which includes, of course, importers and processors, people that process a chemical substance, which is very broadly defined, meaning if you do just about anything with it, it's considered an element of processing, to maintain records. So there is a, a real like life cycle from the point it is manufactured or imported to when it might be processed, to when it's distributed, to when it's actually being used as a chemical substance in a product or otherwise. That entire ch uh, value chain, we have a pretty good sense of what's made, where it's going, and to whom might be uh, exposed to it. Um, and this is under Section 8. We call this the chemical data reporting obligation. It occurs every four years. It applies broadly to entities that uh, have chemical substances that are not otherwise excluded, uh, that either manufacture or uh, have available 25,000 pounds of that chemical substance as listed on the inventory um, per year. So that reporting requirement is every four years, um, and you are required to uh, fill in a, a form, and um, it asks a lot of different information about the nature of the chemical substance, how much is made, how is it made, to whom is it distributed, and um, so on and so forth. Um, There are exemptions from that reporting requirement, polymers, for example, and a couple of other categories. And it, um, a chemical is subject to certain restrictions under TSCA, either Section 6 or 5, as enumerated in the, in the uh, requirement. You might have that threshold, reporting threshold, drop down to 2,500. So if it's a bulk industrial chemical that doesn't have any identified 
risks elements to it such that it triggered a section five or section six rule, it's 25,000 pounds per chemical per site, okay? If it's um, subject to regulation under five or six, or I think under section four as well, it's down to 2,500, which is not a whole heck of a lot. And EPA really counts on that information for purposes of future rulemakings to identify if there are reasons to believe that for whatever basis the agency needs to spend a little bit more time on that chemical substance, the section uh, eight chemical data reporting requirements, which are coming up again in 2020, uh, this is an important rulemaking. So if you're in this space and have clients, EPA is probably going to be issuing the fourth or fifth amendment to section eight CDR reporting requirements in the not too distant future that are derivative of its review of the 2016 reporting cycle. And for those of us in this space, CDR is very important. It's important not only to help EPA get a factual database and a, and a baseline of chemical substances, it's also important from an enforcement perspective because if you're a manufacturing facility or a processor or an importer and you are importing chemicals and you fail to report them on CDR, it's definitely fish in a barrel time. This is one of the easier and most common enforcement actions that EPA can take. Um, another super important re uh, reporting requirement is under chemicals, uh, TSCA section 8E. It requires uh, companies immediately notify um, the agency of substantial risk information. So if you are conducting a toxicological study, or if you found a new chemical substance um, in some biomonitoring data that you didn't expect to see and it's there, um, you, you are required to report that immediately to EPA. The agency takes its 8E obligations very, very, very seriously. Companies are also required to report and retain allegations of adverse effects and submit them to EPA only upon request. You're not required to submit it to EPA as a matter of routine. You are required to maintain records of that. And if EPA asks for it, demonstrate that you have maintained a record keeping reporting uh, system that aligns with the requirements of the law. Uh, and EPA can also require companies to submit information as requested on an ongoing or existing basis with regard to health and safety studies. And if EPA issues a rule, the Federal Register asking for information pertinent to the health and safety study of a particular chemical or chemical category, it usually is a tell that the agency is focusing on this. And if you are manufacturing that chemical or class of chemical or representing a chemical company, that's important because the agency just doesn't willy-nilly say, oh, gee, let's issue an 8D rule regarding, it usually means the agency is focusing on that. And so you want to make sure that you're appreciating what the implications are of that record keeping and reporting rule. So this is a schematic of just the general buckets of record keeping and reporting authority EPA has under TSCA, 8A, 8E, C, D, and E. The, these, this represents kind of the, the basis, the institutional basis of EPA's ability to compel or order manufacturers and others to keep records and make them available to EPA upon request so we can keep tabs on an, a very dynamic chemical environment in the manufacturing industrial sector. So there's lots of authority, and this is an area of great um, enforcement risk. Uh, so if you're doing due diligence, if you're just trying to audit a company, uh, this is an area to be particularly mindful of because you either are doing it right or you're not. And, and EPA's ability electronically to match up import records with CDR reporting requirements is, is pretty good. So if EPA looks at all the information that it has relating to existing chemical substances under those 8D authorities, it might conclude that it lacks sufficient information to make a meaningful determination with regard to an existing chemical substance. So again, you have to look at the different provisions of TSCA in unison. So section eight relates to existing chemical substances and EPA might look at what it has pertinent to existing chemical substances and determine that the information is not sufficient to make an informed judgment about the safety 
or effect from a biological or environmental fate perspective of an existing chemical substance. Section four gives EPA authority to compel the production of new information. And in the olden days, this was usually done through issuance of a, of a rulemaking where EPA would say, we want this class of chemicals or this particular chemical substance to generate the manufacturers of this substance or class of substance to generate these data. And then you would engage in a lengthy rulemaking that usually spans several years and ultimately arrived at some sort of enforceable consent agreement where the manufacturers and importers would agree to do certain studies according to certain protocols and develop those data according to certain deadlines. Well, that, that tool has proven to be not terribly effective. There's a lot of litigation, not a lot of data. So that's what inspired Congress back in 2016 to say EPA has now unilateral authority. If in the agency's judgment, it lacks information. Remember, one of the core reasons for the industrial chemical law is to provide adequate information so EPA can make informed judgments about the risk of a chemical substance. Why shouldn't EPA have unilateral authority to compel that? You always have recourse to go to court, of course, but EPA now has unilateral order authority, can always do a rulemaking, um, but this is an important new add to the agency's arsenal of tools to get what it needs to make informed decisions to make sure people are, are protected. Uh, so it expands that authority. Um, it permits EPA to require testing needed for prioritization. We'll talk a little bit about, remember we talked about high priority and low priority existing chemicals. If EPA wants information on a class of chemicals to determine whether it is a high priority or not, it can compel testing, which is again, a big deal because testing is not cheap, very expensive, who owns the data, who participates in them, how do you make sure competitors are all part of the big data generation party. We could go on and on and on about the ins and outs of this, which I won't, I won't do, don't worry. Uh, but it's an important uh, new authority. Also, in, in deference to our furry friends, uh, EPA is now um, to affirmatively choose to kind of get away from vertebrate testing, okay? Uh, we want to ensure that the agency can reduce, not eliminate, reduce and replace testing to the extent practicable, scientifically justified and consistent with the policies of diminishing animal testing. Animal testing in Europe is, is I think, a higher priority, but I think everybody here wishes to have alternatives to animal testing to inform our judgment about whether chemicals pose a reasonable risk. So now there's a much more concerted effort to develop um, tools and methodologies that can replace animal testing. Uh, EPA did develop and in, in issued it right around this time last year, a two-year strategy or rather a strategy, a strategic plan within two years of promulgation of Lautenberg that talks about how it's going about doing that. So uh, alternatives to animal testing is a very big deal in, in the consulting space. And being an animal lover, I'm thrilled about it. Um, let's talk about existing chemical substances. Remember the, the universe of chemicals are, are divided between new chemical substances and new chemical substances are new to Tosca. Okay, then it might be an existing chemical substance, but it isn't recognized, it isn't cognizable on the TOSCA inventory. So it's not listed on the inventory, so it's considered new versus existing chemicals. And those are all the chemical substances way back when in the late uh, 1978, 79, were grandfathered on the TOSCA inventory. Uh, so if the information, um, that EPA garners under Section 8 and supplements under Section 4 through data generation initiatives, um, if there are continued concerns, Section 6 authorizes EPA to address unreasonable risk through restrictions, existing labeling, record keeping, uh, and even product bans. So Section 6 is the authority or the provision under TOSCA that authorizes EPA to look at an existing chemical substance look at its conditions of use, how is this chemical deployed? How is it used in commerce? And if any of those conditions of use give rise to what is defined under the law to be an unreasonable risk, EPA has broad authority to mitigate, in fact, now it is compelled under the law to mitigate those risks through any number of restrictions, um, 
label requirements, personal protective clothing and equipment in the workplace, or even a product ban, which is the ultimate authority to say, you will not use this chemical substance in this application. And EPA did that recently with respect to methylene chloride, right? And, and, and um, paint stripping applications. So, but we talked about the inventory and EPA's review of the inventory and its resetting of it under Lautenberg, where it went from 86,000 chemicals listed on the inventory to now 40,655. Those are all active existing substances. And under the law, EPA is to prioritize these substances with a view toward regula identifying, regulating, and eliminating any unreasonable risk posed by a high priority chemical substance over a date certain. I mean, it, it stretches out a long time because of the nature of the risk evaluation process, but the, the, the beauty of new Tosca is it mandates a stepwise approach to prioritizing, reviewing, and regulating chemical substances. Uh, to human health and the environment. So high priority substances are chemicals that may present an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment due to potential hazards and routes of exposure, including susceptible subpopulations. That potentially exposed and susceptible subpopulations is a new term of art that was embedded in various provisions of TSCA, derivative of the Lautenberg Act in 2016. So again, environmental justice, concerns, how chemical substances might uniquely impact disadvantaged populations. Might there be susceptible populations because of your own biological makeup or your proximity to a point of, of contamination or route of exposure? These are all important new concepts that EPA is compelled to look at in identifying unreasonable risk, which has made the law more complicated, but also more impactful and presumably more mindful of the implications of exposure to chemicals by virtue of conditions that heretofore have not been considered as part of the, the contours of the law. So what's a low priority substance? Anybody, just pretend you're not reading the answer from the screen. You're right, it is a chemical that does not meet the standards of a high priority substance, okay? So EPA issued the procedural rule implementing the process for identifying high versus low priority substances back in uh, June of 2017, exactly one year to the day that the law was signed into action by President Obama. I, I know that EPA has done a superb job of hitting every single statutory mandate, and there are a lot, timely. So on June 22nd, 2017, one year to the day, EPA got its prioritization rule out, and it's worked pretty well so far. Uh, EPA identified back uh, timely before the end of 2016, 10 chemical substances that were going to be kind of the, the pilot review substances for purposes of applying the risk evaluation process. Uh, those chemical substances were all drawn from a pre-existing list that was generated back in 2014 called the work plan chemicals list. There are about 97 chemicals that were identified on that. And EPA identified 10 of those 93 or 94 for purposes of doing a test drive on its new risk evaluation process that it was required under Lautenberg. So the, the 10 that emerged right out of the box are not a consequence of application of the prioritization process. Rather, they are drawn from this pre-existing list of work plan chemicals. And you might be thinking right now, as I know you are, well, what about those other 83 substances? You know, if I were a manufacturer of any of those other 83 on the work plan chemical list, I'd be thinking that I'm going to be high on that list of prioritization because the way the law works is once EPA finishes a risk evaluation and identifies risk mitigation measures of anything going through the risk evaluation process, it has to replace it with another one. And where do you think EPA is going to draw the next candidate? Exactly. Those that If you're in this space, you should be aware of what 90-some chemicals are on that work plan chemical list because it's a pretty good blueprint to chemical priorities for EPA to take a look at. 
and just put in 24 work plan chemical and Google and voila, it will be there. Um, EPA released, the process is very stepwise and I have a schematic, which um, is right there that we'll get to on what this process looks like, but it's very logical. You don't need to be a lawyer or a consultant to understand it. It's like there are 40,000 chemicals. EPA has to identify high priority chemical substances. If you're not a high priority, you're low priority. If you're high priority, you're going to be evaluated for risk evaluation under the terms of EPA's risk evaluation process more quickly or before you do low priority. And the risk evaluation process is, is very much a creature of, of the regulation. It, it identifies what the process is for screening, for identifying the scope, for identifying how chemicals are selected and reviewed, for identifying what process applies once EPA has identified unreasonable risk, what conditions of use are part of that risk evaluation process. It's not every single use that might conceivably be identified with regard to a chemical substance, because chemical substances have many uses and many applications. EPA tries to look at those conditions of use that could give rise to the greatest potential for exposure, a reasonable risk exposure to humans and the environment. So all of this process is an initial set of risk evaluations drawn from the work plan chemical, the, the, the 10 that I talked about. EPA identified the scope of each of those assessments in June one year after the law was signed um, into law. And EPA to date, going from June 22nd, 2017, to I put this together about a week or so ago, thereabouts, EPA has issued three um, proposed risk evaluations for those initial 10. So it's real important, if you're just dying to know how the process works, take a look at the Federal Register notices that talk about the proposed risk evaluations for the three that have come out to date, because EPA does a very good job of identifying the who, what, when, where, and why it did what it did, okay? Um, and as you know, we do a blog. We put down a lot of information on our TOSCA blog. All of this stuff is there. If you just go to risk um, evaluation, it will pull up all the FR notices of the three risk evaluations that have been issued to date. And EPA, Sadly, if, if Assistant Administrator Alex Dunn were here, she'd be probably cradling her head and wondering how she's going to do it. But they have to get seven more out between now, which is almost August. December is fast approaching. So we got three out of the door, seven more to go. A lot of work. And we've got the, like, the summer silly season in, in between. So it, it, the agency has been really kind of running around with its hair on fire in, in, for purposes of the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. So what is the standard for review? Well, chemicals are evaluated against a new risk-based safety standard and they have to deter, EPA must determine whether chemical use poses an unreasonable risk. That's the same unreasonable risk that was unreasonable back under the old statute. And the important takeaway here, it's a risk-based standard. It's not a hazard-based standard like the European chemical safety law under REACH. It's risk. And with risk comes some degree of palatable risk. It's unreasonable risk that is impermissible. And measures that prevent unreasonable risk from continuing is what the law compels EPA to identify in these risk evaluation processes. And also, as we noted, risk to susceptible and highly exposed subpopulations must be considered, and that's, that's new to the law. And EPA has to identify and take risk management action to address any unreasonable risk. This to me is all very logical, but the rubber hits the road in defining what is unreasonable, and reasonable people may disagree, on what basis is that determination of unreasonability made, whether or not a risk mitigation measure will successfully address that unreasonable risk. This is where all of the controversy and all of the fun stuff happens. And EPA has some exemptions, you know, so-called critical uses, which believe me, very few uses are going to be considered critical for purposes of national security or, you know, very high standard to meet. And risk mitigation actions must be promulgated within two years of completing the risk evaluation can be extended, but again, 
the new law fills in all of the missing parts from the old law because the old law had a wonderful, elegant scheme, but no mandate. This law has a mandated deadline. Once the risk evaluation process has been done and reasonable risk has been identified, you got two years to complete the risk evaluation with an extension of an additional two years. So here's the schematic that EPA set out. It's, it's very stepwise and clear. And I, I do think the new law is much easier to appreciate and you can see the trajectory. But there are a ton of issues that I'm glossing over as to how EPA does what it does against what legal standard, what type of credible evidence is to be acceptable and so on and so, so forth. But I think you get the, the idea. Any, any questions here from you all? The, yes. Um, what exactly makes something reasonable versus unreasonable? Well, is it just a <laughs> all of them or is it different for each chemical? Oh no, could it, it, whether something, a, a chemical is believed to pose an unreasonable risk is very, very specific to the specific chemical identity how it's manufactured or used, in what use application, and to whom that, or to what chemical exposure might be assessed. It, it, it is, um, the agency has processes and, and a, um, a methodology as set forth under the risk evaluation final rule that came out as part of the framework rules. Um, but it is very specific to the chemical and to the specific condition of use that the agency is looking at as part of the risk evaluation process. So it, it, it is a little bit of a moving target in that what is unreasonable with regard to a chemical exposure may not be unreasonable in a, in a manufacturing or workplace setting, but it could be unreasonable with regard to an unprotected consumer, for example. So you have to look at the context. It's a very contextually driven assessment. Um, but I, in my view, the agency has done a very good job of establishing the standards and the metrics in order to make exactly that determination, because th th that is the heart of TSCA, is to make sure that a particular chemical substance, when used as intended in a particular chemical condition of use, doesn't pose an unreasonable risk. If you just keep saying it over and over and over again, you all understand TSCA, because that's what it is. But how you get there and the legal standards and the data and the information it is where all the existing controversy and the many lawsuits have been filed since TSCA was, which I not mentioned, uh, but there are many lawsuits that have been made or filed as a consequence of the final agency actions that have been taken uh, by EPA since um, Lautenberg was issued in 2016. Um, there's a whole special class of chemicals called persistent bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. I'm sure we've all heard of PBTs, right? They are thought to be more inherently uh, uh, risky in that they are persistent, they are bioaccumulative, and they are toxic by definition. So under the law, the agency can kind of fast track the review and doesn't have to undertake a risk evaluation and can go immediately to uh, what are the uses and what are the exposures and how do we go about mitigating those risks? And EPA issued just um, uh, on June 21 of this year its proposed rule, timely, uh, for identifying how the agency was going to go about doing that. So just recognize that with regard to PBT chemicals, special rules apply that fast track their identification and mitigation of, of risk. We already talked about the inventory, um, existing chemicals. The inventory reflects chemicals that are manufactured or used and are recognized for purposes of TSCA. Their chemical substance or a surrogate indicator is already listed on the TSCA inventory. Uh, chemicals on the inventory stay there even if they're not considered active. They don't disappear. They're still on the inventory, but they are not active. Only 40,000 of the 86,000 are considered active. Uh, and only active substances can be prioritized for purposes of EPA's Section 6 risk prioritization rule, which was another benefit of Lautenberg, right? If there are 86,000 chemicals, oh my Lord, how do you go about prioritizing those? Well, we're just going to dispense with all but 40,000 because they aren't in commerce anymore. Now, if somebody comes back and says, well, wait a minute, I got a chemical that's listed on the inventory, it's not considered active, what do I do? We have to submit a special form to EPA 
through the CDX to make sure that it's recognized as a previously inactive but now active chemical substance that will now be eligible for risk prioritization purposes. So just recognize that, I've used this metaphor before, it's like Hotel California. Once you're on the inventory, you can never leave, but you can be considered inactive. And if you are considered inactive, you're not available for commercialization unless you jump through some hoops. That's an important consideration for purposes of TSCA compliance. New chemicals, I have a soft spot in my heart for these. Um, you know, our, our firm, we have many more scientists than we do lawyers because it is so important to understand chemical substances and our desire to commercialize newer, greener, better, more effective, less impactful chemicals to make the world a better, safer, greener, more sustainable place is a passion of ours. And so you need a lot of chemists to really identify these new chemicals and present them in a way that meets EPA's ability to assess what the chemical will do when it is commercialized and operating as intended. And so submitting a pre-manufacture notification or so-called PMN, which used to be done relatively easily in the olden days, is now a much more labor-intensive scientific exercise to harvest the very specific EPA the information EPA needs in order to quantify very precisely what its routes of exposure will be in those all important conditions of use. So TSCA has become very much more similar to FIFRA in that if you have a new chemical substance, maybe it's really not terribly toxic at all. And you can just basically fill out the information and EPA will go through the process. And if there are very few opportunities to pose unreasonable risk, it will exit the system relatively quickly, even less than 90 days, which is the statutory time frame. And if EPA determines there is no, it's not likely to pose an unreasonable risk, you, you can start commercializing it immediately, which is a, a big benefit and change from the old law. But most chemicals are not that way. There's usually some opportunity where a risk might be posed. So the agency insists upon all of this information, production, categories of use, byproducts, molecular formula, avail all other available information that you have. The EPA goes through this elaborate scientific review to determine whether or not your new chemical, when measured against its probable conditions of use, and any condition of use EPA can readily envision because of its understanding of the chemical and its molecular identity, um, will determine whether or not that chemical is going to be regulated or just you're good to go. So um, EPA has a very elaborate process, which it will not go through, um, but it's very stepwise and based on a, a 40 years of experience in assessing new chemicals. EPA scientists do a very good job at what they do. There are focus meetings and there's an EPA release and exposure profile. All of these documents that EPA generates in reviewing your brand new pixie dust is important. And at the end of that process, EPA has to make a determination. And this is critically important and a big change from the old law where you, know, you, you submitted a pre-manufacture notification under old TSCA. And if EPA didn't find an unreasonable risk in the 90 days that it had, and if you didn't hear from EPA at the end of 90 days, on day 91, you were free to commercialize that chemical. Now, you cannot commercialize until EPA makes one of three alternate determinations. The new chemical, or what we refer to as significant new use of an existing chemical, which is considered for all intents and purposes a new chemical, uh, presents an unreasonable risk. If EPA makes that determination, you're not a happy camper, you cannot commercialize, and you really have to think hard about how best to address whatever finding EPA made that suggests there's an unreasonable risk. Uh, or EPA lacks information. It just doesn't have enough information to make a determination. Or the new chemical has substantial production or exposure potential. And usually that is also supplemented with it lacks sufficient information. So if it makes that finding, you, you're not good to go. 
or this is one you want. You want that third finding, that the new chemical is not likely to present an unreasonable risk. So the process of converting the old system where no determination was necessary to one of three determinations under the new system has caused over the last three years quite a lot of commercial disruption, as you might imagine, but it's more quiescent now. The systems are better defined. The regulated community has a clear understanding of how EPA is defining a probable condition of use and what the new back office process is for determining whether your pixie dust can be manufactured or not. So we're in a much happier place than we were this time last year, but it's still an evolving process. So if EPA uh, makes the determinations under one or two, which is unreasonable risk or lack sufficient information or lots of production and exposure potential, EPA must regulate that, which means if you're a chemical producer, if you just spent five years manufacturing a brand new chemical identity for manufacturing or use and you get customers all lined up, that, that determination of one or two is not good news because it might impose upon the manufacturer or use or even a downstream user of that chemical. It might require that they impose or follow certain respiratory protections in the workplace or there might be no ability to discharge the chemical into the environment. And if you're a downstream user of a chemical substance and you were just told that not one molecule of this chemical can be discharged into the environment, that's not happy news. <laughs> and you, you've got to make commercial accommodations for that. So bottom line here is that if you are manufacturing a new chemical substance and you're seeking EPA approval, be very careful on how you present the information. Try to have as much information as possible there are a lot of different models that you can pre-predict how EPA's evaluation will, will go. Uh, the Sustainable Futures uh, models, for example, I'm happy to answer any questions on that, but the PMN process of yesteryear is really dead. And the new PMN process is very granular and very, very tight. What are some of the core issues in implementing TSCA? I mean, I, I think I've mentioned, I gave some reference to the fact that the three framework rules, the, the prioritization or the risk evaluation rule and the TSCA inventory redo were all subject to judicial review by NGO stakeholders and others. One of them, the um, inventory uh, rule has been pretty much resolved, but the uh, challenges to the risk evaluation and prioritization will continue to be litigated in various courts of appeals. We've got a lot of information on that on our website. Um, there were, as I said, under Section 5, lots and lots and lots of concerns with stalled commercialization in violation of TSCA Section uh, 2 about not impeding unduly chemical innovation. Um, I think EPA has done a really good job of working through those with stakeholders and getting to a better place. Uh, we all are worried about EPA's ability to just sustain its infrastructure and have the requisite resources it needs. There's been an exodus of EPA staff, very gifted long-term uh, staffers in these highly scientific positions at EPA. Um, I know Alex Dunn has recently I think um, retain the services of 30 new reviewers in EPA, which is good, but they're not experienced. And so we're gonna be going through some growing pains on just experience um, based EPA staff. And how do we make sure that all of the expertise that is flying out the door with early retirements, retirements, and just attrition generally is, is replaced with new people that are fully aware of this highly nuanced and complicated uh, law. I think at a very big level, there is concern of whether TSCA is achieving one of the goals that Congress and many of us in the stakeholder community wanted, and that is restoring the public's confidence in chemicals that are used in products and, and to which consumers may be exposed. I never lacked confidence that the agency was doing a good job, but I think there is a sufficient chorus of concern with stakeholders that EPA was compelled to do things differently and Congress came up with a new law. And so this new law is intended to restore the public's confidence in EPA's review of existing and new chemical substances so that 
none poses an unreasonable risk to human health and the environment. I think EPA is doing a good job, but that's where the controversy exists. Not everyone agrees, obviously, but I think it might be an open question on whether it is restoring public confidence or if states and others will continue to bang the drum to want chemical specific state initiatives along the lines that we began this discussion in New York and California. That has not diminished a lot over the past three years. There continue to be a lot of state initiatives that sometimes are hard to accommodate if you're a, a global chemical manufacturer and, and wishing very much that the feds preempt state limitations so you don't have 50 state TSCAs or multiple commercial challenges to marketing a chemical. Uh, over time, I think that they would diminish, um, but right now we still see a lot of state initiatives dealing with chemicals or product categories, um, like kid, kid toys and stuff like that. So I'm gonna stop talking about industrial chemicals and pivot to pesticides, unless anybody has any questions. Don't all talk at once. Okay. I, I neglected to mention that all of these, uh, both programs are operated under the capable leadership of Assistant Administrator Alex Dunn, a former ELI board member and former president and general counsel of ECOS, a uh, very gifted administrator. And both um, the TSCA and FIFRA laws are run under the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. We just talked about TSCA, which is run out of the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics. And now we're going to talk about FIFRA, which is run out of the EPA Office of Pesticide Programs. Right now, that office is in Crystal City, Virginia, near the airport. Um, I think it's there are plans to consolidate it with uh, the agency's OPPT headquarter offices at 1200 Pennsylvania Avenue, which might invite some economies of scale. Um, certainly for Alex, who has to jump in a cab and cross the uh, cross the bridge every time she heads over to OPP. But the OPP um, office, I, I have no idea how many people online or in this room will ever have a FIFRA experience other than going to Lowe's or some other farm store to buy a weed killer or, or whatever you might need. But the regulation of pesticides is a exquisitely data intensive, well-oiled machine that dates back to the 40s. Um, it's based, similarly, it's a risk-based statute based on a reasonable risk. So it's not like no chemical risk is countenanced or permissible, no unreasonable risk um, is, is countenanced. So it's very similar, slightly worded differently, but very similar risk benefit statute. Um, there are multiple divisions in the Office of Pesticide Programs because it not, it's not like one pesticide. There are all these different types of pesticides, which we'll talk about, and all of these different specialized impacts of what a pesticide might impose on human health and the environment. So the biological and economic analysis deals with some of the economic impacts. Biopesticides are thought to be less toxic than more conventional, traditional pesticides. They have their own division. Health effects division deals with human health impacts of, of ex exposure to, to pesticides. Um, it, it's a very elaborate, very well settled area of EPA regulation with which we've been working for over 30 years and we have great respect for OPP. Um, FIFRA is just like TSCA, it is intended to be the federal statute that deals with uh, pesticides. So. That said, many, an increasing number of states will have their own pesticide programs, most prominently in California. California has a very robust pesticide review process. Um, similarly, New York, Florida, and a handful of others, Wisconsin. So you absolutely, in order to manufacture or distribute in commerce or market a pesticide, you have to get it approved by EPA but you also have to have it registered in all 50 states in which, or in any state in which that chemical is going to be marketed. But that state pesticide approval is very much a ka operation. It's just a ministerial once a year, you know, one and done, 
250 $300 state pesticide registration. But in these states, California, New York, Florida, and a handful of others, there's a more robust de novo review of the chemical substance. So if you're in the process of representing a client and they say, hey, I've got a brand new pixie dust that is going to just take care of every potato beetle we've, you've ever seen. And it's not like anything else on the market. It's like, great. You have to first get it approved by EPA. And then once EPA approves it, it has to be approved in every state or registered in every state that you want to do business in. And in a handful of those states, you have to go through an additional review that might invite additional data requirements. Okay. Uh, well, what is a pesticide? What makes this pixie dust uh, an industrial chemical here and a pesticide over here? Anybody. It's what you intend. It's a substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. So a substance is considered to be intended for a pesticidal purpose is what requires the registration. It's what invites the FIFRA jurisdiction. And if, it, and if it, that pesticidal purpose is intended, whether it's stated or not, is not really relevant. If you intend for that pesticidal functionality, if the person who distributes or sells the substance claims, states, or implies that the substance can or should be used as a pesticide. So it's, it's tricky and there's a whole developing area of law regarding whether chemical substance that might have a, a functionality that might be interpreted as pesticidal, but it might be more, you know, a nutritional supplement and whether it impedes the growth of the substance. There are many, 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 many interesting issues here, but at the end of the day, the big line in the sand is if you intend a pesticidal functionality, you're dealing in FIFRA land, not Tosca land. And some substances might have those potential attributes or actual attributes and how you understand and market them or claim them or intend them determines that jurisdictional divide. And then to make matters even more interesting, you know, there's the FDA piece as well. So just recognize that what bucket you're in is largely derivative of what you intend. Now, in terms of the regulatory scope of that chemical substance or mixture, we have the, the active ingredient, or we call them AIs, not artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And AI is an active ingredient. And that's what really bestows upon a chemical mixture, or what we call an end-use formulation. That's usually what you buy it at the store. That's what imparts the pesticidal functionality. That's the, that's the pixie dust. And then the stuff that is added in there to promote the distribution or some other physical attribute, but not biological attribute of the substance is called an inert. So if you look at any pesticide label, it usually says 0.00001% of the AI and 99.00001% whatever of the of inerts or varying, you know, amounts between the active and the inert. And there are different categories of, of pesticides. We have the conventional pesticides that, you know, you think of uh, chlorpyrifos and glyphosate, uh, Roundup, things that are big weed killers or herbicides. Those are considered conventional because they are, they've been around a while and, and commonly understood. They're so-called minimum risk pesticides, which are treated to regulatory deference because they are thought to have a diminished environmental impact and have a minimum risk. There are biopesticides, antimicrobials, the you know uh, stuff that is embedded sometimes in treated articles that prevent mildew or growth of uh, bacteria in, in uh, products. Uh, and treated articles is, you know, this might be a treated article if an antimicrobial is baked into the, to the iPhone in order to protect the article itself and not to bestow any pesticidal functionality to people who touch it. Often paints on walls have so-called in-can preservatives that prevent the paint from succumbing to mold or mildew or some sort of product degradation. So the inclusion of an antimicrobial in the in-can preservative is not you don't have pesticide painted on the wall here, but you might have a pesticidal component in the paint to protect the paint, not to bestow diminished uh, germ or enhanced germ protection on the wall. Okay, 
So the regulatory framework is really pretty straightforward, uh, very much pre-market. You can't just make any damn thing, call it a pesticide and zip into the market and make a lot of money. EPA has to approve it. It's a risk-based safety standard, no unreasonable risk for non-food, okay? Uh, and reasonable uncertainty of no harm is a standard for food uses. Uh, the burden is on the registrant to prove that. So there has been kind of an alignment between TSCA and FIFRA. Remember I said before with respect to new chemicals, now the manufacturer of the new chemical has to demonstrate that the substance is not posing an unreasonable risk. That's always been the case under FIFRA. And why do you think that is? FIFRA regulates biological agents that are intended to kill. So you want EPA to have a very high standard of safety because these are intended to impart a biological functionality that kills something. That's not the case with respect to industrial chemicals. So the burden has always been on the FIFRA registrant to demonstrate the safety standard. And you know, I say here in the slide, unlike TSCA, FIFRA is use specific, not chemical specific. TASC is really becoming very use specific, but it will be years before there is a, a, a meetup in that regard. Under FIFRA, every chemical commodity or use of that particular AI is subject to its own registration review. And that's becoming the case with respect to new chemicals where conditions of use are now very much a part of the pre-market review. So there is this alignment between the two statutes growing as a consequence of the, the law change in 2016. So what do you do? If you're a manufacturer of a brand new chemical substance, you think you make it, this is a, the best ant killer in the whole wide world. Well, there's a bunch of data requirements that EPA has. These data requirements are codified at part 158. They are extensive. You have to really demonstrate against a lot of tests it cost a lot of money to generate that your product is safe when used as intended it's efficacious it does what you say it's going to do it's going to kill the critters or do whatever you claim it does uh, epa has a lot of discretion to look at the data tables and waive certain data requirements if your particular use site doesn't invite the testing for a particular standard that would otherwise apply and this is what all the EPA scientists do over in Crystal City in reviewing you know, your, your, your chemical, your conditions of use to what you wish to apply this new pixie dust will determine what data package you ultimately have to submit. Um, data development is in the millions and millions and millions of dollars for active substances. Um, and it can take years for EPA to plow through those data or for the registrant to argue that it should waive out of certain data because why do we have to go through you know, field trials for something that might not require that uh, because we've demonstrated that whatever residue might apply on this particular commodity is below a standard that could pose harm. So there's a lot of science, a lot of data, and a lot of time that goes into uh, pesticide product review. Um, a lot of the data are certainly protected uh, for purposes of confidential business information and trade secret. Uh, EPA has really adopted a, a, a narrowing interpretation of what is protected information. There's been um, much more clamor in more recent years to disclose what are inerts. Are inerts really not biological? Isn't inert really inert? I mean, these are all the, the issues that have compelled NGO and other stakeholders to insist upon greater transparency in what is in a composition that people might be exposed to. And so some companies are uh, address, you know, more generous disclosure policies, uh, as I said, with regard to the New York and state uh, cleansing and cleaning product ingredient disclosure laws, the lineup between when a FIFRA product might be embedded in a cleaning agent you know, these are all complicated issues that run into one another because there are competing issues that arise with regard to product ingredient disclosure. But FIFRA doesn't require disclosure in all cases of every single ingredient because your confidential statement of formula is very confidential. But increasingly, there's pressure to make sure that 
not just EPA knows what's there, but users of the substance know what's there. Um, and very importantly, if, if you are like to argue, like I do, um, and if you like policy, um, there's an, a very arcane area of law called data compensation arbitrations. Like, like say, for example, you've just spent $20 million to get your pixie dust registered under FIFRA. And you now have it registered in every state in the union. It's a brand new active ingredient, never before invented. You've spent the better part of your professional career perfecting this pixie dust. What do you think the law countenances with regard to competition derivative of this new product? You want, you know, Congress in its wisdom wanted to protect the confidentiality of this new AI. And under the law, the law allows basically a 10 year um, period of exclusivity. During that 10 years, nobody can rely upon your data to enter the market. So if you wanted to replicate this pixie dust, you would have to generate the same data that the first registrant generated in order to perfect this, this new chemical and develop what is a functionally a monopoly. So if you, if you like anti-competitive laws, the Sherman Antitrust Act, confidential business information, this is the area for you. So you get 10 years of exclusive use and then 10 years in a day, what do you think happens? Assuming that it's not subject to any type of patent. 10 years in a day, the anybody else can jump into that market by citing your data to say, okay, I'm generating exactly what this guy produced over the last 20 years, develop the market, he has a lot of brand recognition now for a highly efficacious new pixie dust in the FIFRA space. After 10 years, Joe Schmo can jump into that market and manufacture the same chemical provided you make certain showings to the agency. But what about your investment in that? Can they just hijack the data? No, you have to offer to pay for those data. And how you quantify what the value is of that investment, the passage of time, the development of that market, the name brand recognition of that product is worth something. And that's what a data compensation arbitration is intended to address. Usually the parties negotiate how to pay for the reliance upon that intellectual property right, but failing acquiescence to an agreed upon standard, you go to a AAA, American Arbitration Association, arbitration. They are held usually here in Washington, but they can be elsewhere. There can be one arbitrator or three arbitrators, depending upon what the parties decide. And you basically just duke it out. You have trial-like proceedings where you're represented by counsel, generally. You might have three judges, the arbitrators, and it's on the record and you have the right to cross-examination and you bring in all kinds of experts to assess the, the value of the data and the intellectual property rights that have derived from your investment in this new product. So it's a very interesting area, a very arcane, um, but that's, that is intended to jumpstart and ensure competition, but also reward chemical innovators who are out there developing new products at some considerable business risk, right? Because if you're first in line, you often are the one with your head blown off. So you wanna make sure that that person is rewarded for their innovation and compensated for their investment but after 10 years, it falls off. And after 15 years, the data compensation period ends for those data. Um, and then after that, you, anybody can cite data for purposes of developing their own registration or purchase it from an entity that you know, has, is an approved source of the registered active and you don't have any data compensation obligations. So it's a very interesting area. Um, here's a, a standard, um, label i don't know how many when you go into lowe's or wherever you buy your products do you ever look at a label i've been known to like kind of pause in this aisle and just oh wow i didn't know that the label is very important and if you if you ever look at um some of the more innovative you can kind of peel them open and you expand them out they're like really really long it's important to read 
not the ones in foreign languages, but mm -hmm. it's really important to read the label because it will tell you the things that you need to do in order to avoid injuring yourself or inadvertently compromising some critter that shouldn't be exposed to that substance, okay? But every single word on that label is scripted by EPA rules and regulations. You can negotiate with the EPA a little bit, you know, regarding whether you need to do, but the, the font size, the color, the images, the text, it's all highly regulated. So every single word means something. Ingredient, what claims you can say, the use directions, very important warning statements. Um, what do you do? You know, who's the registrant and how do I get in touch with them? Uh, what if something happens? Is it 800 number usually? What uses are inconsistent with the label? Really, really important stuff. So next time you buy a pesticide, just read the label. Um, the framework, you know, there are uh, new actives, products and uses, um, and what EPA has long been uh, challenged by is, is just the, the press of business, the sophistication of this, this space and innovation and the need for product manufacturers to continue to tinker with their product, which they do. I mean, there are actives out there that have been around since the mid 40s and you continue to innovate to improve, deal with shelf life issues, add new uses, change the formulation. Every single change requires EPA approval. But how do you manage that in a way that you can conduct business operations? So EPA developed this Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, PREA started, that's the acronym, Pesticide Registration Improvement Act, that provides a, a very rational kind of framework for EPA to identify what type of new chemical product or new use or change in label what category that change falls in, how much do you pay, because just like TSCA, it's a pay-to-play program. You have to self-fund EPA's review of your change, your regulatory ask, and when can you expect to get it? So this has provided, this PREA has provided much needed certainty to the business community. So if you submit a new use application, you look up what the category is, what kind of pesticide it is, what use it is, indoor, outdoor, uh, and what the change is, and you can specify how long it will take and how much it will cost. That's just for EPA action, not to actually develop the new use, but how long will the EPA review process takes. So it's a very, very um, efficient system. It can run from a low end of four months to the, you know, kind of grouchy two, two years, um, and they can be extended but EPA is measured in terms of its performance against how well it hits its PREA dates. Um, so it doesn't like to renegotiate PREA dates to say, okay, we're gonna give you another three months to fix this or do that. But EPA is able to do that, but there's a, there's a limit to how long those extensions can go. And the beauty is that the regulatory community has some sense of the how long and how much, because at the end of the day, that's very important for maintaining you know, business continuity and also innovating in a way that will make products better, safer, more effective, less expensive. Um, I also talked a little bit about the safer or reduced risk pesticide. Um, chemicals that are fall within this category of reduced risk or safer um, are amenable to getting fewer, less fees expedited reviews on the theory that, well, if it's not as you know challenging a substance, we should be able to review it faster. Um, there's a dedicated team of EPA resources to, to do this. So you're rewarded for your innovation in a space that, that um, is promoting reduced risk pesticides. Um, the various programs that EPA has um, include minimum risk pesticides, and all of these are available if you just stick in any of these words on the EPA, very good OPP website, you'll see what exactly applies. Uh, there is a category of reduced risk conventional pesticides and then biopesticides, which are thought to be, again, by nature of their um, product composition are amenable to a reduced risk, safer uh, use pattern. Enforcement under um, FIFRA is very real. 
the, the uh, agency has a lot of tools in its enforcement toolbox. Um, one thing that we all are aware of in, in our space is if you get what is called a stop sale use or removal order, the acronym is ASURO. If your client is on the receiving end of ASURO, that's not a happy day because basically it's EPA or a state with which it is working with EPA has some reason to believe that your product is misbranded or doesn't accurately reflect some aspect of that which is registered at EPA um, and it, or that you are marketing a product that isn't registered as a pesticide but should be because you have an implied or actual pesticidal claim associated with the product. And a stop sale means that you, you stop sales. You, that whatever is on the shelf, you embargo, you red tag, whatever might be in the channels of trade, you might have to either you know, tell them to hold the phone and don't distribute it, or um, you know, just not further market that product. And sometimes that's the subject of a negotiation with the EPA. It's like, well, geez, oh, Pisa, we just distributed to Lowe's or some retailer like Amazon. Uh, how do we get those back? Well, some you just can't, but if there's a reasonable prospect for embargoing them, that's what a stop sale order does. Uh, the agency has the authority to impose administrative penalties, civil penalties, and of course, criminal penalties. Um, the enforcement is done through largely EPA, but the agency works closely with state pesticide agencies or seed agencies or other agricultural services to you know, be the boots on the ground. Um, so the, the consequences are significant, but because of the nature of the beast and the authority EPA has under FIFRA, you know, things can be stopped in their tracks immediately. We were, we had a stop sale and use order um, a, about a year or so ago of a product that was marketed as a plant nutrient, and EPA was of the view that it contained pesticidal components that were functioning as pesticides and so the marketing of this plant nutrient without a pesticide label was impermissible um, that, that case was fascinating to to sort out because whether a chemical product in this space might contain a product component that might have a pesticidal property but you don't intend it to operate as a pesticide these are very, very tricky issues. And EPA really is jumping into these more aggressively now. Um, because again, we, we began this discussion with what do you intend? If there's a chemical, a chelating agent that might have a pesticidal potency, but you don't intend it to act as such, is it a pesticide? These are the issues that keep us up at night. What are some of the current um, FIFRA issues? I mean, you, you might know, better than anybody as consumers, uh, certainly the Endangered Species Act. This has been an area of continuing, continuing controversy between the Department of Interior that is tasked with um, implementing the Endangered Species Act, the use of chemical substances that have a very significant or potentially significant impact on animals, plants, and humans. Um, so the, the, the push and pull of the Endangered Species Act and FIFRA has been the source of continuing uh, frustration and um, a lack of clarity, and we'll probably continue to do so. Uh, for the same reasons we talked about in the industrial chemical space, institutional sustainability is an issue. We've got a lot of very, very sophisticated scientists and others in the Office of Pesticide Programs who are now early retiring, retiring period or just leaving. So we want to make sure that that institutional capacity is replicated and that the agency continues to enjoy a robust scientific component to do the very, very important work that it does. Uh, the pollinator policy has been, you know, from time to time in the news on the impact of registered pesticides. Are they a causal agent to diminish pollinator populations or not? Uh, that's an area of significant scientific and policy review. Very recently, the chlorpyrifos decision came out. Um, an interesting, um, that was July 18th, where EPA issued a, um, came out with this decision 
denying the Natural Resource Defense Council the request that EPA revoke all tolerances and cancel all registrations for chlorpyrifos, which is a uh, well-used conventional uh, chemical. We, we did a very detailed blog posting. Uh, the reason the, the issue is, is interesting for we lawyers is it involves the confluence of what is the reliance and, and relevance of epidemiological data versus EPA's more traditional application of safety uh, standards and safety factors for risk assessment purposes. Um, EPA declined to revoke the tolerances and cancel the pesticide registration. I'm sure this will be probably litigated more. Um, but again, the issues are very, very interesting for those of you that um, are interested in how epidemiological data that the petitioner community thought deserve, deserve more relevance for purposes of uh, um, urging EPA to cancel the tolerances and revoke the, the registrations. Um, the continuing interface between Prop 65, which as you know, does apply in California for uh, reproductive hazards and uh, carcinogens. It requires labeling and warning requirements. There is a, a constant interface between FIFRA labeling, because you can't monkey with a FIFRA label, but in California, if your pesticide product elicits reproductive or developmental harm or has a cancer potency that inspires labeling and warning requirements. So the, the push and pull of that is, is an evolving issue. And also just how does EPA, as good as it is, keep up with evolving technologies and be conversant in, in, in ensure its institutional literacy with regard to these really evolving pesticide uh, technologies and in agricultural technologies. That is a, a continuing problem. And I think we in the regulated community should work more closely with EPA to ensure that these really nifty technologies that we have going for us, double strand RNA and other um, really, really sophisticated targeted agricultural technologies that the agency has the institutional literacy and skills to review them against this somewhat antiquated FIFRA law. So that's just a continuing problem and challenge and opportunity that we in this space see. And I listed it here just so you're aware of that. And as you pursue your careers in FIFRA and TSCA, as I know you will, you can help make the world a better place by working with EPA and other state agencies and even Capitol Hill to make sure that we are fully aware of the potency of new technologies and how instrumental they are in combating um, plant food security issues, which we are all facing with enhanced speed uh, as a result of climate change and aridity issues and all the other issues of which we are painfully aware. But plant chemicals and agricultural technologies are more important today than ever. And it's our job to make sure that EPA understands what they are and how to regulate them. So I've left exactly 20 minutes for Q&A and uh, happy to answer any questions from our totally exhausted audience here in the in Washington. Do we have any questions for in the room before turning over to online questions? You asked your question already. You don't get another one. <laughs> uh, only one no. person. <laughs> um, so what? Do you think some of the biggest issues are for EPA dealing with companies and trying to get them to actually follow these regulations and give all the data? Are there any like hindrances with that? No, I, you know, my own uh, view is that sometimes we in the regulated community probably do not take full advantage of all the information that is available. Um, we, we deal almost exclusively in the Tosca and FIFR space. Uh, both domestically and internationally through our, our uh, consulting affiliate. And, and sometimes I'm kind of chagrined when people call and say, hey, you know, I've got this, what do I do? It's like, well, you know, did you look at EPA's website? Did you look at the stepwise process for what EPA needs, what the standard of review is? There are a lot of tools and materials out there that help people understand at least the basics of the process, and that's both for Tosca, new chemicals, and FIFRA, existing chemicals, new pesticide products, or new uses of existing technologies, okay? So th that's kind of frustrating, 
Um, sometimes it's frustrating to, to recognize that the, the enforcement world is not equal. Um, EPA has limited enforcement resources, right? I mean, it just doesn't have the bandwidth to address every clown out there. So our clients are upstanding, committed entities that want to do the right thing, produce products that are safe and efficacious, and follow the rules. And when we hear of a bunch of other clowns in the space that are not following the rules, we often want EPA to do something, but it doesn't have the bandwidth to do that. So in a perfect world, you know, it'd be great if there were better opportunities to identify and prevent mischief in the marketplace that doesn't reward people who will do the right thing and, and prevent and shut down entities that don't. And that's just a consequence of a shortfall of resources and perhaps the industry not policing itself as, as much as I think it should. Does that help at all? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Do we have another question in the room? Um, would plants that are bioengineered to be pest resistant fall under FIFRA? Is that more FDA or like is that separate? I'm sorry, know? what was the question? Sorry, would like uh, GMOs and plants that are bioengineered to be pest resistant, would that count as a pesticide? That would that is, fall under FIFRA? Well, still? It, it, there's some shared, there could be um, some shared, certainly biotech and, and um, that cat class of technologies is regulated under FIFRA. There might be an element that is also registered or regulated under uh, TOSCA as a um, microbial, because uh, depending upon, again, its uses and applications and where it stands on the spectrum of a, a starter material that might be registered as an, as an MCAM, a microbial commencement of activity notification, um, that leads to a uh, biotech element that is regulated under FIFRA. So it could be some share, but it's definitely under that space and not not um, uh, FDA. Thank you. Thank you. Any other in-person questions? All right, we'll go on to our online questions. We received one uh, regarding PCBs uh, that were exempt from TOSCA that continue to be produced in the US today. Um, also, I guess they referred to them as non-legacy PCBs, if that helps clarify. Um, their question was, does the fast track process for bioaccumulating chemicals in the new TOSCA have provisions for reviewing previous exemptions to TOSCA? If not, what would be the process to challenge old TOSCA exemptions like the PCB exemption for pigment manufacturing? manufacturing sorry about that no no, no that's uh, that's an interesting question you know the the pcb piece under lautenberg relates to persistent viral accumulative and toxic chemicals as those terms are defined tosca section six which predated i'm sorry there's a six e i believe um that we do very little PCB work because it doesn't come up all that often, but I'm pretty sure it's 6E deals with um, PCBs. Yeah, polychlorinated biphenyls um, are regulated under pre-existing TOSCA section 6E, and PCBs are P, um, persistent bioaccumulative toxic chemicals, but have their own kind of niche regulatory scheme set out in TOSCA. And as you can see, there's no red line strikeout for section 6E. So that piece of TOSCA, which predated Lautenberg, has its own regulatory review. And I think the question might go to, are there opportunities for revisiting any of those? Anybody can always, under the Administrative Procedure Act, petition EPA to revisit or open up an existing rule, whether that is what that question anticipated um, or not, but that, that might be a, a better venue for um, revisiting an existing exemption from regulation under the 6E provisions pertinent to PCBs than trying to fit it into the uh, persistent bioaccumulative toxic provisions of fast track review under Lautenberg. And if the person who asked that question is not happy with that, just give me a call and, and we can we can talk about it. Nope, they just said thank you. So <laughs> thank you, you nailed that one. <laughs> um, we have another question online. And there 
asking if you could briefly go over the export requirements in 12D and if EPA has considered restricting the article or articles. Well, um, there are, we didn't talk about import or export provisions under TSCA, um, but not surprisingly, there are certain substances that require export notification under TSCA section 12B. Um, if these chemicals are regulated by EPA in a particular way, the theory being if something is regulated here and you're exporting it to another country, maybe that other country should know about it. So you have to submit this notification. Um, and the specific requirements that apply are derivative of the nature of the regulation pertinent to that substance. Um, there are exemptions for chemicals that are in articles because if something is embedded in an article, it's presumed that if it's in an article, the likelihood for exposure to that chemical, either being exported or coming into the United States, um, is limited. So it wouldn't be an impermissible export or import if that chemical that is otherwise regulated under sections four, five, or provisions of, of elements of six uh, are being exported in an article or imported in an article under section 13. So I think the question might go to whether imports and exports of articles of chemical substances that are other regulated under four or five or six are subject to notification requirements and by and large they are not. There are ex um, exemptions however um, that are very much driven by the nature of the chemical and whether or not the opportunity for release from the article might be more uh, pronounced than otherwise. So there are exemptions by and large if it's, it's in an article it's not going to be subject to regulation. Thank you. By and large. <laughs> we had a question regarding the concept of uh, the general public's, I guess, potential lack of confidence in the EPA. And if this is just a lack of confidence or maybe more generally a, um, you know, lack of general awareness or communications. And if you had any, you know, ideas from your personal and professional experience on what the EPA could do to better reassure the public, but also maybe communicate uh, the general information that is being provided by the EPA on FIFRA and TSCA? It's an it, excellent question. And the, the truth always lies somewhere in the middle, right? I mean, I, my own personal view is that EPA scientists, decision makers, staff do a superb job doing what they do in discharging their regulatory and, and legislative mandates under these laws. They're dedicated, they work their tails off, they're com completely professional and deserve much more recognition than they get. That said, in a perfect world, you know, there might be greater communication from the agency in explaining how it does and why it does what it does. Um, and that's a, an obligation and an opportunity shared also by the regulated community. You know, but there are all types of restrictions that might apply regulatory limitations, budgetary considerations that sometimes discourage or prevent more discourse on some of these very important issues. Um, I know, for example, Assistant Administrator Dunn, when she took over earlier this year on January 2 um, of 2019 as Assistant Administrator in the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, greater in, in transparency and outreach to stakeholders is very much one of her priorities and she's she's doing that she's walking the walk and talking the talk by putting a lot more information online um, a lot more granularity as to how task is being implemented we if you look at our blog there's a new website that identifies how well the agency is meeting its uh, metrics in reviewing confidentiality claims under under TSCA. So there's a lot more information being pumped out, how well people are reading that, understanding it, or even aware of its existence is, of course, another matter, because we are all burdened with so much information and so often not in a context that we fully appreciate what it means and what it doesn't mean. But I think the agency is definitely committed to being more transparent and open. That is definitely Assistant Administrator Dunn's commitment. Um, I think EPA does a good job, but it is incumbent upon industry as well to contextualize and make sure that we know what a chemical risk is and what it isn't and what we can do to 
do things better. It's a shared responsibility, very much so. Thank you. We had a question um, regarding the key sections under TOSCA. Is there a particular section that, you know, arises with the most challenges and barriers for industries or processing, um, I guess, other industries and businesses when trying to get a product approved through the EPI? You know, it, this is probably a, just a bias, but because we work so hard on new chemical applications and trying to commercialize newer, better, cheaper, greener, more sustainable chemicals to just do things better and more efficiently, Tosca Section 5 um, is both a challenge and an opportunity. And it's a challenge because historically the standard has changed so much over the past three years. I'm not sure industry is quite aware of that and kind of used to doing things the way they always have for the last 40 years. So it's like turning a tanker around in the middle of the ocean. It takes time, but we're getting there. But the granularity and the level of review that EPA offered under old TOSCA and offers under new TOSCA, but according to a different standard, is challenging. So that has been the subject of, of immense frustration, but it is resolving, it is clarifying, and it is better now than it used to be. But I think that has been one area where if you're spending all this time and energy to make things better and more efficient, and you're not getting into the market, and you're being regulated to boot when chemicals that might pose even greater risks have been grandfathered under the old law and are unregulated, you know, that's a tough pill to swallow. And, but EPA gets it, and um, it is uh, much more transparent now as to the standard of review, what you need to do to get your new product approved, and how do you stay in the market and avoid um, both posing unreasonable risk, but also doing things in a way that uh, might invite enhanced regulation. So that, that's been an important um, change and maybe an area that has been subject to disproportionate review and attention, but we're getting there. Thank you. Do we have any final questions or concluding remarks before we end today's program? No? Okay. I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and for your great questions. We hope you'll continue to think and learn about law and policy products. You can stay up to date on our summer school series on our website, eli.org. And on July 30th, we'll have our final summer school session and we'll be diving into environmental justice. An enormous thank you to Lynn for your vast knowledge on this topic. It's been fascinating and informative, and we're so glad you joined us here today. Additionally, all handouts from today are available outside of this conference room on the coffee table. And once again, thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.